And here to discuss it is United Australia Party Senator, Ralph Babette. Ralph, great to have you on the show again. Thank you. Before we get to the subs deal, though, i got to say, you came under fire this week from the comrades at The Guardian <laughs> for working in your real estate business while also being a senator for Victoria. I mean, I thought you responded reasonably well to this, to The Guardian, but what's your message to the people of, 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 of Australia about who say a senator should be a full-time job? Well, first of all, Corey, I'd like to say that being a senator is, in fact, my full-time job. And I can attest to that by the fact that I had way more hair on my head before I started this damn job. It is full-time 24-7. However, I will say that when I did come to Parliament, I came so from a real from the real world. I had a real job beforehand. I wasn't one of these uh, one of these people that started out as some underling in the Labor Party or the Liberal Party machine and worked my way up the food chain and then uh, waited for a safe seat to pop up to occupy that seat to lord over my fellow Australian. That wasn't me. I had a real job and that job was working in the family real estate business, which I still do now here and there once or twice a month on a Saturday or a Sunday, not when Parliament is sitting and not when I have some senatorial duties to do, only in my personal spare time, Corey. Now, it is no different, Corey. It is no different to the politician that goes back to the family farm in their time off. And might I tell you that 16 parliamentarians own farms right now and they go back, I'm sure of it, to the family farm to milk the cows or whatever it is that they're doing uh, when they're not sitting in parliament. So it's no different to that. Not to mention, Corey, not to mention at the moment, about 50%, roughly 50% of all parliamentarians have an income outside of their senatorial salary. Now, some examples, they own cafes, uh, they have construction businesses, they have uh, you know, farm stays, so basically Airbnbs where they rent out rooms and such things. Yeah. Even the Prime Minister, the PM, makes 100k a year off his property portfolio. You know what I do? I work and for my small real estate business. And that's a good thing, Corey, because right now, I, when I'm out there on a Saturday or a Sunday uh, in the afternoon in my spare time and I don't get paid for it, I hear from people. And you know what they tell me, Corey? They're suffering. They're suffering because of I a decade that. of mismanagement from the Liberal Party and they're yeah, suffering Senator, because that of is an impassioned, the, the that Labor is an Party is continuing impassioned defence and I'm with you 100%. 100%. <laughs> we had doctors in the uh, parliament who had to maintain clinical practice and we were grateful for all our health reasons that they were there. So I don't have a problem with it, to be honest. Let's go to the subs deal, though. $18 million per job. It seems a heck of a lot of money to me. And um, is it worth it? Corey, is it worth it? Absolutely, it's worth it. It is worth it 100%. We have a China right now that's being very, very aggressive in the South China Sea. We have a China right now that attempted to set up bases in the Solomon Island right on our doorstep. We have a China right now that's spending more money than ever on their military. We have a China right now that you know, unless I'm drastically wrong and every single other person on this, on the face of this planet that's looking at this uh, carefully is wrong, is looking like they're going to want to take Taiwan and bring it back into the fold. We have a China right now that's being very belligerent and threatening the world order. That's what they're doing right now. And we're protected by subs that are from the 1980s, Corey, the 1980s. Think of it as like an old clanker Holden Commodore diesel-powered subs. Whether we like it or not, Corey, we have have to spend this money. And my job, Corey, my job is to make sure that we get every single dollar of value from that spend possible. But yes, it probably will, will blow out yeah, because challenge. the government, let's be honest, they couldn't organise a beer in a brewery. They're useless. I think many Australians agree with that sentiment for sure, particularly when it comes to defence spending. Hey, can I go to the US uh, quickly? The bailouts are seeing subtle moves to do away with the risk of bank failures and bank runs. I think it's got all the hallmarks of an introduction to a central bank digital currency, which is the ultimate in government control. And we've even got a trial of that running in this country. Do you see dangers in a central bank digital currency for regular people? And how can you stop it if you do? 
Yep. So the central bank digital currency, it's not, or well, it is similar to the digital transactions that you currently see right now in your net bank with one key difference. It's based off the blockchain, which means that it's completely programmable and trackable. The government can see where you've spent your money, what you spent it on, where you've spent it, who it's gone to, every single detail of it. They can even do things like uh, uh, restrict you from purchasing certain things. As an example, Corey, as an example, have you purchased too much red meat this month? Well, that goes over your carbon allowance. You can't purchase red meat next month. Perhaps you can't buy an airline ticket because that's too much carbon emissions. Perhaps that's what happens. Perhaps the government decides that you need to have a negative interest rate on the money in your account to increase, uh, increase spending in the economy. The danger of the central bank digital currency is that it's not truly a currency. What you need to think of it like is a coupon. It's a coupon or a voucher which is programmable and the government can do whatever it wants with it. It is more dangerous to your freedom than a standing army. You must resist the central bank digital currency. Yeah, I know the people must resist it, but so must the politicians, uh, Senator, and that's what we're counting on you and others to do. Okay, before I let you go, the price tag of this free renewable energy keeps going up. Well, the freer it is, the more it costs. This week, we're told to expect electricity price hikes up to 30% later in the year. Now, every single government has promised lower power prices and they've only delivered price increases. How do they keep getting it so wrong, Senator? They keep getting it so wrong because either they're incompetent which is what I suspect, or they just treasonous, treasonous people. What we're seeing right now is we're seeing the government put an end to cheap, reliable power, which is coal and gas, refusing to look at nuclear and driving us towards this unsustainable path of net zero renewable energy garbage, which isn't renewable at all. Renewable energy is not renewable. Uh, it's Most of it's made in China when we talk about solar panels and batteries anyway, or controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. And it's not able to give us enough power to power our nation. It's a, just basic high school economics. When there's less supply, when there's less supply, prices will naturally go up. And that's what we're seeing today. So we're shutting down our country. We're outsourcing our productive capacity to nations like China. All our manufacturing is going offshore and our politicians are doing nothing about it. Well, apart from me, some in the coalition, and of course, one nation, of course, apart from us, no one's doing anything about it. We're in a position right now where we're shutting our country down. We're outsourcing everything to China. We need, we need to go back to reliable power. We need to look at nuclear. If the government we is sure so hell bent on destroying coal and gas, nuclear is the way to go, Corey.